Hello and welcome to the Institute for Government for this event on rail reform, making Great British Railways work for the next generation. I'm Matthew Gill, a senior fellow here. Great British Railways was announced before the summer in the William Shapps Plan for Rail. It's a new public body intended to reduce the fragmentation and complexity of the current rail system. Expectations are high, so we're delighted to be discussing it today. We would particularly <coughs> like to thank the Rail Delivery Group for kindly sponsoring the event. So how will Great British Railways or GBR take shape? Can it deliver a rail network for the next generation that works for politicians, passengers and the wider public? I'm very pleased to welcome a really fascinating panel to discuss these issues. Keith Williams chaired the review behind the plan for rail. He's also the chair of Royal Mail and Halfords, as well as a former CEO of British Airways. A warm welcome to you, Keith. I'd also like to welcome the Right Honourable Lord Dowling of Rowlanish. Alistair Darling really needs no introduction. He's best known as a former Chancellor of the Exchequer, but he's also a former Transport Secretary with an interest and expertise in these matters. Thank you for joining us, Alistair. Maria Machinkosis is the CEO of Midlands Connect. She has had a 20 year career in the industry, working as a transport expert nationally and internationally, as well as leading on long term strategic planning for the Midlands. <coughs> it's great to have you here today, Maria. And also welcome to Andy Bagnall, the Director General of the Rail Delivery Group, which represents and coordinates the train operating companies across Great Britain. Andy has extensive experience in government affairs and as a special advisor to two cabinet ministers, so he's no stranger to these discussions. Thank you for being here, Andy. Welcome also to our audience online. Please do send in your questions. You can type them into the panel on the right of your screen. You may wish to add your name and where you're viewing from, and we'll be live tweeting from IFG events using the hashtag IFGRail. Please follow and tweet along. We'll have a video and sound recording of the event on our website within 24 hours. So can I first turn to you, Keith, as the chair of the review and ask you to talk a bit about your vision for GBR. Uh, perhaps you could comment on your most important conclusions and how they've been received since publication, and perhaps whether you look to any other public bodies or economic sectors to guide your thinking. Yeah, th thanks, Matthew. Um, I guess the, the trite answer to your question is that uh, there are actually 62 important conclusions um, and they're actually listed in the document as commitments. Yeah. <coughs> I think the important thing is that people note that because the success of the review will actually be uh, be held to account on the delivery of those 62 commitments. Now, now obviously, that's a, a, a trite answer, but um, you know, for some people, say accessibility would be the most important issue. Um, you know, for others, um, you know, other things are. Um, but if I, if I were to sum it up, I'd go back to what you said actually in your introduction. If, if I was to pick on one single thing, I'd pick on actually what you said about fragmentation, um, because um, I think what the review points to is a removal of the fragmentation that was in the industry previously. Um, and, and I'd say is that the inefficiencies that that brought for both passenger and for taxpayer. Um, so if, if, if I was to pick on one thing, I'd, I'd pick on that. Um, now, the, the, other, the other extreme that people therefore get to is with the formation of Great British Railways, that actually it's a move to centralisation and in some quarters, renationalisation. Yeah. Um, I'd say is the review is anything but that. Um, what it does is it sets up a guiding mind um, actually for what the passengers wanted principally uh, and freight, which was actually an integrated railway network. Um, so if anything, GBR is, is set up to do precisely that. After that, actually, what it's trying to do is to create an environment for the private sector to, to thrive and for local communities to thrive. Um, if you like, um, looking at their ability to be closer to the needs of their consumers and their localities and bringing that to bear 
to make Great British Railways work in the interests of passengers. So that, that's broadly what I'd say is, is, if you like, the important conclusion of, of the review. In terms of looking at other sectors, um, if you look at the review itself, um, it, it started in September 2018. Um, and in the summer of 2019, we put out a series of six papers, which actually, if you like, were, were thoughts on the review for people to, to comment on. Uh, and one of those papers looked at models internationally um, across the world. Um, that part of the review um, actually demonstrated that relatively the UK actually had a pretty good railway system. Yeah. Um, it, on a number of measures, it actually fared very well against international competition. <laughs> so um, we looked at international competition, and then obviously I, I come from an airline background. So um, I've got to say, initially when I came to the review, I was drawn, you know to actually looking at open access across the, across the system. Um, but I pretty quickly discounted that on the basis of, if you like, what, what the consumer, what the passengers wanted and what the best way of delivery was, which was an integrated network. And it's that that, if you like, led to the conclusion of having a guiding mind under GBR. Right. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, on, on the theme of learning from experience, I guess, Alistair, as Transport Secretary, you announced the abolition of the Strategic Rail Authority, which had been set up in the late 90s with somewhat similar objectives to, to what GBI is trying to do. Um, what do you think the new body can learn from this? And um, from your wider experience, are there lessons you would draw from the success or failure of other public bodies across government? Well, first of all, can I say that I very much welcome Keith Williams' central uh, recognition of the fact uh, that you need a single guiding, guiding mind uh, to run Britain's railways. Uh, it was fragmented and it ignored the fundamental point with railways that track and train are intimately related. Uh, you can't treat them you know, somehow in isolation of each other. Uh, my only quibble is, for goodness sake, don't call it Great British Railways. You know, you can imagine a wet day when the trains aren't running, there's leaves on the line, and people say, whose fault is it? Well, it's Great British Railways. And if there's someone in Whitehall who thinks that somehow this is going to be some extra glue to hold the UK together, I can tell you, speaking from Edinburgh, it won't. Everybody's going to call it British Railways or British Rail. Why don't we just stick to that, just as I see you sticking to the logo uh, that will go with a new organisation. On the, the, the um, Strategic Rail Authority, basically that was put on as a bolt-on because in, uh, when we uh, were elected to government in 1997, John Prescott, who was originally responsible for the transport, amongst other things, recognised two things. One is, if you were going to do anything uh, to improve the railways on track or train, you needed money and the private sector wasn't going to come up with it. Uh, and central government could, albeit in you know, limited amounts through uh, the, the, the Strategic Rail Authority. The second thing is it was an attempt to bring some order uh, to the chaos that was already emerging with train companies competing with each other to get into railways, for example, blaming each other if something went wrong. I came to the view when I became Secretary of State in 2002 that, that simply wasn't going to work. And actually the guiding mind to some extent was moved into the department, which I always saw as a stopgap. But like many stopgaps, you know, it went on for rather longer than uh, um, I intended. Um, you know, we changed the legislation in 2004, amongst other things, establishing the Rail Accident Investigation Branch. But we you know we tried to streamline the system and critically to get Network Rail and the train companies to work together. Uh, which you know I think has been announced every couple of years by my successors as uh, a transport secretary. So I think you should just put the, the SRA to one side. What is critical in my mind is two things. You've got this guiding mind, which uh, Keith Williams has rightly recognised. You need to have a structure that takes account of the fact that the railways are very different in different parts uh, of the, the UK in terms of commuter or long distance or what's required. If you've got any attempt to do levelling up, railways will, will um, play an important part of that. But the second thing, which I you know, can't emphasise enough, both as a former Transport Secretary and the Chancellor of the Exchequer, if you don't, central government does not produce the money, you will not get any of the things that is, is it, that uh, Keith recommends. 
You know, I see talk of there being a 30 year time horizon for funding. You know, that seems to me to be a triumph of hope over um, over experience. Uh, we set in place a 10 year horizon, which I think is about realistic. But if you really want to make sure you've got the track, you know, with when you bring things like onboard signaling into effect, if you want to make sure the trains are of high quality and, and, and uh, providing the service that people want, you need investment. And I just conclude on this point because I always do. I get asked to speak about the railways. Do not ignore the fact that there is a spectre here and it's called HS2. And my guess is, speaking as a former Treasury Minister, that will absorb an awful lot of money that would otherwise go into the railways. Don't underestimate the importance of the money. It isn't going to come from the private sector. Uh, there's no railway in the world, railway system in the world uh, that operates profitably. And that aspect is absolutely critical. But I do welcome what uh, Keith has done here uh, because you know the franchising had uh, come to the end of the road of the end of the rail uh, some time ago and you know he's made a pretty good job. I just hope the government implements it. Thank you, Alistair. Um, I, there's a number of challenges there. I think the let, let's let's start with the, uh, the 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 question about whether to call this GBR and what that and what that means. And perhaps on that note, I can bring Maria in to talk a little bit about uh, the relationship between the national and and the regional and how GBR is actually going to interact with um, uh, local and regional players and what should its objectives be in this context and what power should it have. Um, Alistair, I know you were Secretary of State for Scotland at the same time as you were Secretary of State for Transport, so it may be that on the devolve question, which is also come in with the Q&A, you might like to come back in after Maria's had a word on that. Thank you, Matthew, and uh, I couldn't agree more with Alistair. I would like to actually pick up out of the 62 recommendations that uh, Keith uh, mentioned earlier, um, three points that particularly from a Midlands perspective were really, really relevant the day that GBR was launched um, and proposals for the rail review and reform were launched. One was about, we were all reminded that this is one network, um, you know, and that was very important to always remember that even as important as the Midlands is, um, we are actually served by a national network um, that needs to help and serve national outcomes, not, not just regional or local outcomes. So that was pretty important. The accountability angle was really good as well. Everybody really welcomed the fact that it was more important than ever to know exactly who's going to be accountable for. And also the passenger was put at heart. And when we talk about passenger, it's about changing needs and demands and for GBR to be well informed, they need to be provided with the right information to understand what those changing needs and demands are. And to Alistair's point, in different parts of the country, they'll be different. Um, so, so that's when the trade-offs between what a national one network uh, GBR needs to cater for, uh, you know, and that, you know, the work that uh, Peter Hendy will not doubt contribute to that, making sure that the United Kingdom, you know, they're connecting the union. That's, for instance, one of the examples that GBR should should address. You know, this is about national network serving for for the for the country. Um, then, obviously, Midlands Connect, that is where we come from. We've got some really good ideas of where growth is happening, where are the connectivity failures in terms of east-west connectivity, for instance, and we can provide the evidence, not only from a transport perspective, but from also from an economic, wider sort of economic and social perspective to GBR, and hopefully GBR will be then uh, digesting the information, giving it due regard, and this is when things start to get complicated, what do you mean by giving it due regard? Um, uh, how do you actually show the stakeholders of the Midlands that they take into consideration our proposals or priorities? And that could equally apply at local level for mayors. Um, we've got a very ambitious mayor, for instance, in the West Midlands, who knows exactly what he needs for the local railway network. Um, so his proposals will also be need to be heard. Um, so this is when um, proposals on the GBR for regional divisions um, need to be really uh, considered really carefully. It's, it's not only about, you know, what platforms will GBR put in place to allow local stakeholders and key stakeholders at local level to inform and shape and influence the decisions, not only in terms of the planning, but actually in the delivery of railways. Um, and that's going to be extremely important because, um, as, you, as you said, we all got different needs. Um, there'll always be trade-offs to be, to be, to be have but at least the transparency and that certainty, that evidence will lead 
a final decision by GBR um, is going to be extremely important going forward. So that is um, a, a, an overview from a Midlands perspective. So when it comes to powers, um, we would like to see real powers to GBR in terms of uh, ability to be agile, to change decisions of fares on, on timetables, to meet that forever changing uh, demands uh, from passengers. And, uh, and that should respond to the needs of towns and cities in the Midlands too. So we could go on and on about what powers, but most importantly is how GBR will show um, exactly how they're given regard to local needs, not just the national network, which is still important, by the way. Thank you, Maria. Um, on that note, because it's an extension of it, I'll, I'll, I'll just come to one of the questions that's come up in the in the Q and A. Now we'll we'll take most of these later, so do keep putting your questions in there. But there's a question from Andrew um, at the Welsh Parliament Research Service. Can Keith Williams elaborate on how the proposed arrangement will apply in Wales and Scotland? So how some of these these issues would 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 instantiate in the in the devolved administrations? So Keith, maybe if you'd like to give a brief answer to that, and and Alistair, then if you'd like to come back and um, react to that. In the review, um, we, we took account of today's reality, if you like, that, um, that Scotland was was devolved, um, Wales was where where it is. Um, so um, I, I I took a view, or we took a view, that if you like, accountability and responsibility needed to sit together, um, and yeah. Up until the point where government passes the accountability out to, to devolve parts of the union. Actually, we should follow where we are today. Um, so it, it was largely a position of, of no change. However, um, you know, to, to Maria's point is that what we were trying to recognize that um, if you like, local knowledge and local input was, was necessary actually for the for better efficiency of, of our railways. Um, you know, and, and a classic example would be uh, in a situation where heavy rail is not always the answer in a city, it actually might be light rail. Um, so although we, you know, we, we tend to talk about heavy rail from, from where we are in terms of this rail review, actually there are other modes that actually might be better in certain circumstances, and that needs to be taken into account. Um, Albeit with the proviso again, going back to the you know the fundamental, which is actually we needed to operate a, an integrated railway. Um, so you know not everything can begin or end in say Manchester. A lot of the rail goes through Manchester, and that needs to be part of the integrate integration of our railway system. But you know going back is definitely not looking for a solution where everything is run from the centre. I, I didn't feel that that was the right answer. Alistair, does that add up to you? Yeah. Well, if I just add to that, and you know, particularly a reference to Scotland, um, of course, the the franchising operation in Scotland has already devolved uh, to the um, Scottish government. Uh, not that it's been a happy experience, and indeed, uh, they are planning to bring it all into uh, public ownership um, from next year. Of course, trains run to Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Inverness that uh, you know come from London and other parts of the UK. So it's both uh, devolved, and there is a national rail network. Uh, and of course, um, it, it's worth bearing in mind, you know, as someone who lives in Scotland, that one advantage of having the track um, on the balance sheet of a national organisation is that when you get, uh, you know, a landslide or something, which sadly you get just about every year, or quite major expenditure. It's much easier for today network rail to do that than the Scottish transport budget to have to find the you know sometimes quite substantial sums to restore a, lane, a railway line that isn't carrying necessarily a large number of people. Um, all I think I would say here, and I do, do need to dwell on it, is that uh, frankly, whatever is decided, it will get caught up in the current state of Scottish politics. Um, um, and which is why I call it, I tell you, calling it Great Britain, British Railways isn't going to help that one. Um, I, well, I do think, you know, just as Maria was saying, it is important though to recognise in different parts of the country there are different requirements and there's got to be a recognition from that, not just in terms of running trains, but in terms of investment. You know, I've long argued, uh, you know, from the time that I was Secretary of State, that one of the things that is very wrong in England, uh, for example, is that the emphasis has been on North-South 
uh, traffic uh, to some extent down to the West Country. What you really have in the Midlands, the north of England, is a complete lack of investment uh, in the trains across the country, in particular from the East Coast ports to the northwest of England. So there's got to be a significant part of it. And if you are serious about levelling up, then that must be part of it. It's not that transport isn't the whole answer to, to levelling up at all, but it's got to be an important part. And just recognise that Scotland and Wales are different. They're not in English regions, they're different. Uh, but I'm sure that can be accommodated and we must not lose sight of the prize of having recognising the fact that you have a national railway system that runs throughout the United Kingdom uh, and that hopefully if this is implemented successfully you will have a single guide, guiding mind but the people on that board uh, need to be quite um, alert to the fact that there are you know deeply held views in just about every part of the country as to what the railways should be doing. Thanks, Alistair. Um, Andy, perhaps I could bring you in here. Um, we, we've talked a, a, a lot about some of the many things that that, that, that that GBR will be trying to achieve, but how will it change the role of private sector operators in the system? And how should GBR be trying to manage the relationships between the private and public elements of the system to achieve the best outcomes? Th thanks, Matthew. Um, I think the first thing to say is that train companies have been calling for a lot of these reforms for, for a number of years, including replacing the franchise system uh, and, of course, creating an arm's length body. Uh, so Great British Railways, as the white paper set out. So uh, train operators very much welcome a number of the reforms uh, that we've called for being included uh, in the white paper. I think it's fair to say that the private sector part of the industry sees this uh, as representing a once in a generation opportunity to get rail reform uh, right so that the railway uh, can become the backbone of national renewal and, and connectivity as we come out of the come out of the pandemic. Uh, and obviously that that necessarily means uh, a rebalancing of, of public uh, and private sectors and a change role for operators. Um, looking at the sort of positives, I think there's a huge amount uh, uh, to be welcomed in terms of Great British Railways. Um, other uh, colleagues on the panel have already said that the railway needed a guiding mind to better align uh, track and train and uh, align those incentives between infrastructure management and specifying the operations. And um, uh, despite uh, Alistair's very well made point about uh, about the money needing to back it up, clearly the idea, the aspiration of, uh, of 30 year strategies on things like infrastructure, decarbonisation and skills, if we get it right, should should deliver considerable benefits. Um, Great British Railways can be much more sort of long run and whole system uh, in its thinking, obviously bringing together parts of DFT, Network Rail and, and my own organisation, uh, RDG. Um, things like a, a whole P&L approach uh, to the railway should help with cost control uh, and simplifying some of the some of the complex money flows in the in the system. But underneath all of that, the detail is going to be absolutely uh, key if we're going to harness the benefits uh, of the private sector. Um, uh, Keith talked about the private sector thriving. Uh, I, I hope he's right. I think we want, want the same thing. The, the devil, as always, will be in, uh, be in the detail. Um, and if we don't get that right, if we don't harness the private sector in the right way, I don't think we're going to fulfil the white paper's aspirations, ultimately to deliver for customers, uh, both passenger and, uh, and, and freight customers. And of course, if we don't, if we don't attract customers back, uh, we won't ultimately deliver for, for taxpayers either, given the, the, the pressing need to regrow revenue uh, through fares to reduce an otherwise uh, unsustainable level of subsidy that's, uh, that's, that's growing through the pandemic. And, and look, I'm not just asserting the role of the, the private sector. I think it's got a very strong record of, of delivering uh, through the franchise system over 25 years. Uh, quite clearly, the franchise system was under enormous pressure. It was sort of creaking at the seams. I think it had uh, lived its life. Um, but actually, over 25 years, the franchise system delivered a huge amount. Passenger numbers doubled, uh, services increased by a third. Uh, the uh, finances of the industry were transformed. A two billion deficit turned into a into an operational surplus. 50% um, more jobs uh, in the sector than uh, than at the point of privatisation. Uh, freight renaissance. Uh, I could go on. Um, uh, perhaps the only other thing to mention is one of the busiest but also safest uh, railways uh, in uh, in the world. So the private sector, I think, delivered benefits and it's going to be absolutely critical that we preserve those in the new public private partnership. And the absolute key to that for Great British Railways to get that right, your your question of how does it how does it manage the private sector? The key is going to be the new passenger service contracts that the white paper points to and the bridging national rail contracts that are sort of the, the journey to get there. Uh, as well, of course, as the uh, the new access regime for, for, for open access and, and freight. 
And to get the best of the private sector, I think to really focus on uh, sort of passenger freight customers, GBR on the one hand has got to act as an intelligent client, uh, much in the way as sort of TFL does. Uh, and then on the other hand, operators are going to need the right incentives and flexibilities to be able to respond uh, to customers and to changing demand patterns. Um, I firmly believe you just can't specify good customer outcomes and innovation from the centre. Uh, a bit like the discussion we've just had about the need for local input from the regions, I would argue that operators know their markets best. Uh, and it's uh, they who are going to be able to respond to uh, greater working from home, hybrid commuting patterns, uh, and also actually an opportunity in terms of growing, growing leisure travel, domestic tourism, staycations and so on. Um, but to do that, passenger operators have got to have those, those levers in their hands and the right incentives uh, to be able to, to sort of look outwards, if you like, to the customer rather than inwards um, to the Great British Railways uh, bureaucracy to sort of ask for permission for, uh, for, for them to act. And, and obviously that also means we need to ensure the access and charging regimes allow freight and open access operators to respond to, to customer demand. So I, I think it's really good that the white paper sort of has a bit of a, a, a spectrum of contracts. There's a commitment in there that no one size fits all. But it's really likely that the first passenger service contracts are going to be at the concession end, the more tightly specified end of the spectrum. So we need to get this right, right from the off, right from the word go, uh, because even those tightly specified concession contracts uh, are going to need the right levers to be with operators to deliver the right, um, the right customer outcomes. Uh, we also need to avoid uh, the danger, I guess, of, of designing processes that work with the early passenger service contracts, but then restrict the room for manoeuvre to deliver more commercial freedom uh, and ultimately revenue risk transfer that the white paper talks about in later ones. So look, a, a lot of potential for GBR to add value in a, in a reformed public-private partnership, but the detail of that, that contractual relationship with the operators uh, to drive, allow them to drive the recovery uh, with all the sort of economic and environment, uh, environmental benefits that brings is going to be absolutely critical. Thank you, Andy. Um, I th Let's turn to Keith again now. I mean, obviously, we're looking at a transition here between a quite complicated system to uh, another system which is going to be simpler, but still has quite a lot of a lot of complexity. So there's questions here about how to maintain a, a customer focus, flexibility for operators, uh, and um, and potentially even even what what role uh, there is for regulation over the the industry to make things work in the new structure. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about how you think things are going following the the white papers publication. Uh, and um, and what you think the challenges are for the transition looking forward? Yeah, I, I was taken by something that Alistair said actually, and uh, he and I did discuss at one point in the review um, at the, the, the setup of the SRA. And it, 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 I refer back to what he said earlier, which is that you know he started in something in 2002, and the legislation came along in 2004. Yeah. If you, if you fast forward almost 20 years, um, here we are in 2021, and you know we're not likely to see legislation until two or three years hence, probably 2024. Um, so you've got to manage the interim. Yeah. Um, I'd say the starting point is good um, in the sense that um, you know, all parties, I, I would say this one time, all parties wanted reform. And I think there's a good starting point as well in the fact that, if you like, the government wasn't wedded to what I call political dogma of uh, renationalisation or privatisation. It actually was more interested in simplification. Um, so I think that's a great starting point. Um, and I'd hope to Alistair's point is if, if something happens to Scotland is that we don't lose sight of that goal. Yeah, simplification. And that's that's in the interests of the railway. Um, but I then go is you need early signs of success. And I'd like to pick on something else that Alistair said, which is um, it's fine to have a long-term funding plan. And a long-term funding plan is, is great, in a sense, for bringing private enterprise in because they have a sense of what the industry might look like through the piece. And particularly, for instance, if you're a, a rolling stock provider, you need that because your, your assets are long-term. So you need the long-term view. But uh, equally, you need to tackle the short term. Um, and we're about to enter into a spending review. Um, and you know what I see is that um, there are really good business cases that are going to come to Treasury. Um, and I think the most important of those is actually uh, fares reform in retailing. 
where you can actually demonstrate that for, I'll call it a relatively small investment, a few hundred million pounds, that actually the payback on that in terms of cost reduction and in terms of efficiency of revenue collection and in terms of customer satisfaction is very, very short term. You know, it's, you know, it, I, I come from, from industry and I can't see a project with a better return than this one. Um, not only do you, do you give the customer what he wants, you give it at a, at a fairly minimal investment for a pretty immediate return. Um, that to me looks a good business case. Um, but I think we'll see the proof of the pudding, what if and when that is approved, if you like. Um, because we will never get a better opportunity for fares reform. Um, you know, we talk about a complicated railway, one that has 66 million fa filed fares is, is a complicated railway. Um, and you know, the opportunity of retail reform and fares reform is huge. And you'll never get a better opportunity because the revenue risk is currently with government. Um, so we need to take advantage of that today. Um, but we need to do it today because uh, over time things will change. To, to Andy's point is we might incentivize the private sector to take revenue risk again or some revenue risk where it makes sense. And it's better to get those reforms done now before you reach that point. Um, so, you know, to my mind, the next couple of years are going to be crucial in actually demonstrating that we're starting to make change. In terms of your question on uh, regulation, um, the other thing that struck me on fragmentation, and, and Andy will know this himself, is that when we came, uh, and us probably knows better than all of us, is that when you actually looked to try and pull the costs of running the railway system together, um, it was an enormous exercise. Yeah, um, there was no ready reckoner as to this is what the industry spends because it was in so many different pockets with duplication, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> yep. What we've got is actually an opportunity with a single P&L to see where the costs are. And the role of regulation should be to ensure that both performance and efficiency are there. And that, that to me is, is, is the role of uh, regulation, the primary role of regulation. Obviously you've got safety as well. We shouldn't lose sight of safety. But you know, the regulation to me should look at the performance and efficiency of rail, which, which has not been there over the last 20 years. Thanks, Keith. Um, Alistair, you'd like to come in? Yeah, if, if I may. Um, if anything worries me, it's actually the implementation of all this. I mean, there's a massive amount, as you know, Keith said. There's a the practical stuff which we've touched on. Uh, there's how you move from franchised contracts to the new service contracts and so on. Uh, but you know, I'm sorry to go on about this, but you know, it's, you know, maybe my my chancellor experience rather than the transport secretary. We are about to enter into a period where there'll be quite strong um, headwinds. Uh, the, the, the government a couple of weeks ago announced uh, quite major expenditure on the NHS, which and then, you know, on, on social care. If you look at what was um, set out in the, the last budget, the rest of public expenditure is, you know, pretty flat. Uh, and the one thing, as all of you know better than I do, uh, that really does get the public interest in uh, relation to railways uh, to a new level is this perennial argument about how much do you charge in fares as opposed to how much subsidy is coming from the general taxpayer. Now, I don't see that getting any easier, frankly, and it's going to be you know, quite controversial, uh, especially at a time when it's possible, we don't know yet, that a lot of commuter revenue may go, you know, as the labour market adjusts and so on. Um, we don't know yet what's going to happen to, to long term, uh, uh, you know, the longer distance rail travel. But you are going to be making all these changes at a time when uh, the costs of the railways uh, will continue to rise because of investment, because of, of um, you know, the constraints on public expenditure. Uh, and, you know, there'll be the pressure on fares, which is, say, is what really what conditions, especially for regular uh, uh, um, 
um, rail users. So that's why, you know, I, you know, the, the reason I flagged it up early in my contribution is that you can't walk around this. And, you know, I do understand what all of you are saying about the 30 year um, uh, commitment. And believe me, I'm going to say this as an ex politician as I am now. Uh, it's gr the best thing in the world is to announce a 30 year plan because you can be very sure you won't be around when uh, the chickens come, come to home to roost 30 years later on. So you just need to be aware of that. I, I'm not denigrating Keith's done an excellent job, but I just think, you know, as we discuss it now on implementation, you need to go into this with your eyes very wide open. I, if I can come back on it, if, if this was a, a railway run at maximum efficiency, um, then um, you, you'd really worry. Yeah, um, I think we can actually demonstrate that there's about a billion and a half of costs that can come out relatively quickly. Um, but you know, as in all things, for that cost to come out, you've got to replace it with something. Um, and, and the obvious example, to, you know, to give an instance, is is ticketing. Yeah, um, ticketing today it is it, it's, it's in the dark ages. Yeah, um, if you look at the, why the airlines went to e-ticketing, it it was not actually to to benefit their customers. It did benefit their customers, but it was actually to take three billion of cost out of the industry. Um, but it does. It did need some investment to do that. You know, great yeah. business case. So um, you know, all I'm making the case of is, yes, hold hold the industry to account to take cost out, but don't starve of it in investment to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. Good luck with that, Keith. Um, just bear in mind that when we were doing the reforms nearly 30 years ago, there was a rising you know, economy. Uh, growth, you know, was a, was a long uninterrupted period of growth. Uh, that's why passenger rise, passenger use of the railways went up actually more than whether it was privately or publicly owned. Uh, but um, all I can say is whilst the Treasury will always be receptive to good ideas for taking money out, long experience shows us that uh, it, the relationship in taking costs out and actually getting the benefit can sometimes be nearer to a 30 year time horizon that you might not, you, that you might you think, but good luck with anyway on that. So, I, I, okay. I, this is what um, I said actually, these are short term payback projects, you know, very short term payback projects. Um, I hope so. In, in the light of this parliament. <laughs> We're effectively answering a question actually that's come in from Anonymous in the chat, which is what are the consequences if rail doesn't do well in the spending review? Um, Andy, I know you wanted to come in on this. Well, there's uh, there's another question in the chat as well, actually, about uh, about about fares reform and that. And I, I was just going to acknowledge Alistair's uh, point that, of course, the, the Treasury sits behind a lot of the aspirations in the white paper and uh, and is going to need to put the, 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 the money, the finance behind them ultimately in order to make them happen. Um, Keith made the point, which I very, very strongly agree with a moment ago, that you know now is the best opportunity in a generation uh, to get fares reform. But it's quite clear to me that if you read the white paper, the aspirations are there. The white paper sort of wills the ends, but it doesn't quite yet will the means. And uh, the cynic in me would suggest that perhaps some of those debates were parked to the to the spending review uh, and the Treasury is yet, yet to have its say. But you look at what's in the white paper, pay as you go, uh, simplification of long distance fares, all of those will have uh, will have a price tag to them to move to the means of delivering them single leg pricing, which is something that again we've been uh, train operators long long calling for. So I absolutely agree. The uh, the comprehensive spending review is going to be critically important to delivering fares reform as a as a big and probably the most tangible element of rail reform from the from the passengers' point of view, as well as then some of those other things we've been talking about the money behind the long term uh, strategies and the investment in rail. Thanks, Andy. M Maria. Yes, uh, just to add to the to the debate on fares. Uh, obviously, from um, a Midlands Connect perspective, we will want to see the fares integrated with the wider public transport. Uh, that's part of making it really easy for those regular commu commuters that Alistair was referring to. You know, people do not just travel on railways. People will want to travel on a car sharing scheme or a tram or a bus and jump onto the railway. So we've got to be really creative in that space. The second point goes back again to Alistair's point of leveling up on investment. I think one of the things that GBR are going to have to really get a grip and control is on the ANEP on what we call the enhancement program. And um, that's part of the long term versus short term. If you keep just getting the pipeline bigger <laughs> and not focus and not clarity on exactly what needs to happen when, 
we're going to always have that dilemma of what needs to happen in the next five to ten years and that compromise of that prioritization that we all would like to see in place. Um, so I, I will say, yes, I agree, 30 year might be challenging, but let's make sure that we invest properly in that pipeline and enhancement pipeline uh, program that at the moment the operators and the local authorities, we're all asking for more transparency and clarity because uh, that's going to be very, very important moving forward. We need to know what's planned when and we need to build that consensus together. Thanks, Maria. Um, Andy, perhaps I could, um, before we turn to questions from the from the audience, perhaps move on to a more general question that we, we have sort of discussed, but what, what kind of qualities do you think the leaders of the new organisation will need and how will its culture shape the, the ability it has to succeed? Um, well, I certainly think that uh, other than the sort of the contractual model that, that I've already mentioned, culture is probably going to be the single biggest determinant of, of Great British Railway's success. Um, the white paper obviously call, calls this out specifically, uh, commitment number five. Uh, and I've heard Andrew Haynes and, um, and Peter Hendy actually both explicitly state in different ways that GBR, it cannot be network rail 2.0 2 or it won't succeed. Um, from the point of view of the, the train companies that I represent, I think the short version is Great British Railways uh, needs to be a, a guiding mind and not a controlling mind. So it needs to be uh, truly focused on the sort of on the passenger rather than, uh, than than focused overly on the sort of the running of the uh, of the kind of the railway in and of itself. And I think to do that, it probably needs the right relationships to other parts of the, the system and both DFT and Great British Railways are actually going to need to be comfortable with uh, with decentralisation. And uh, uh, Maria and Alistair actually both both touched on that uh, already. And of course, then it needs um, you know it needs that contractual relationship decentralised with operators, as as I've said. Um, the other thing I think that's really important in terms of the outlook of GBI is that it avoids the potential to be production led rather than customer uh, focused. Um, RDG, when we made our submission to Keith Review, we called for a new arm's length body to sort of sit equally above track and train and hold them both to account on, a, on an equal basis. Um, obviously, by folding the infrastructure provider network rail uh, into Great British Railways, there, there is a danger that infrastructure is, is sort of prioritised over train, train operations, um, shifting away from the commercial focus of, uh, of operators and that focus on, on passengers. Uh, there's also, of course, the danger of um, GBR markets own homework on infrastructure, but that's a, perhaps a separate issue. So I think, look, to, to, to avoid that and get that right uh, entrepreneurial and customer led uh, culture, GBR has got to recruit its leaders really widely from across the rail industry, um, including obviously from private sector operators, but also uh, from, from beyond the industry. And um, Alistair touched on this earlier in the context of devolution and sort of Scotland and Wales, but I mean, we're going to need leaders for GBR who are really quite politically uh, astute and sort of and, and agile. Um, they're going to need to work uh, in partnership with uh, the Westminster government, with devolved authority city regions, but also then act autonomously and sometimes make some of those really tricky trade-offs, you know, acting as the sort of the, the balancer of, of different interests. And that's true right from the off in this sort of immediate setup and mobilisation phase to, to spring next year and then a sort of transition phase. And then ultimately when, when GBR itself is, is on the statute book after, after legislation, all the way through that uh, leadership quality is going to be going to be absolutely um, critical. And we need a really sort of laser like focus on, on chasing every scrap of revenue on sort of commercial outlook uh, and entrepreneurial outlook to ensure that the, the, the railway recovers. And um, well, one other thing, actually, if I may, on just on, on sort of culture, I think we, we need diversity of thought and that wouldn't be a bad thing um, uh, to actively prioritize, uh, as I'm sure that those sort of mobilizing GBR will. Um, and that includes drawing on different professional disciplines, as, uh, as I've mentioned, but I think also taking the opportunity uh, to attract people from more diverse backgrounds uh, would be a good step. I think we're very good as an industry in providing a pathway for, for social mobility, um, but we can probably do better on getting more women uh, and uh, more people from ethnic minorities into, into key roles in the, uh, in the industry. But look, ultimately, as I said in, in kind of my first contribution, the key is for the whole system to look to look outwards. Uh, and perhaps we're, we're not as good as that in the in the railway as we should be. So so that's the, the cultural thing that Great British Railways has got to get right. Thanks so much, Andy. Um, 
So let's now look at um, some of the questions that are coming through. There's quite a lot, so please um, bear with us. We won't be able to cover all of them, um, but do, do keep liking those that you would like to see uh, asked and, and, and adding more. Uh, the, the most popular one actually is gonna take us in, in quite a high level strategic direction, which, which is from Anonymous, uh, saying planning reform has been in the news. How can GBR help to deliver more homes? So how does rail uh, strategy fit in with, with planning? Um, Maria, do you want to take that initially? Great question and a really important one. I mean, you know, today we heard about the levelling up white paper and the new task force. Um, we know that government is going to have to look at infrastructure, not just from a railway. We're going to have to think about digital energy and we're going to have to think about serving wider purposes. So this has gone back to culture. We need to stop planning for the railways just for the sake of the track and the planning and the railway. We need to start thinking much more widely about what the railways will do to help the wider agenda. This is the point that I made earlier. Railways need to serve not only you know, the passenger, the rail passenger, they need to help support um, our towns and the cities uh, to, to, to come out of this horrendous crisis that we just faced and move on into a more sustainable and prosperous community. So it got to, in the planning, in the thinking of GBR has to be a wider agenda. And to do that, you need to, going back to Andy's point, you need to be really well informed on the thinking that's happening locally. Where are the places uh, that have got um, the most growth planned for what is what actually what's happening in rural areas. Nobody talks about rural areas and we always tend to just focus on very congested uh, cities at the moment. But we're going to have to really think completely different in terms of the way we're going to uh, plan for transport in the future. Because um, I said COVID is transformed completely the way people are going to plan their journey. Uh, the timing and the frequency and how they're going to work, where from, and how they're going to go and see partners and clients and people. So, so yes, um, more than ever, the railway is going to have to be much more embraceive of other areas of, of government, because um, that will help government then hopefully uh, make it much easier for them to continue to invest in the railway. Thanks, Maria. Would anybody else like to comment on planning? Yeah, I'll, I'll come in with a, a brief comment, if I may. Um, I, I totally agree with Maria's point, which is, um, what is the railway there for? It's there for to support communities and what communities want to do and, and housing. I guess the question on housing is that linking a railway to a housing development um, like creates the housing and it creates the environment and it creates economic value. Um, so, you know, absolutely behind the thinking of bringing local communities in was was that development. Um, the, the other extreme, I, I'd, just, I'd just like to explore the other extreme and it, and it goes to, to why economy is important to my mind. Um, if we wanted to run a railway at the minimum cost to the taxpayer, direct cost to the taxpayer, um, the obvious thing to have done would have been to have gone open access, yeah, which is auction off all the slots, um, you know, all the, all the routes and let people just do it at auction. Yeah. Um, I think the, the problem with that, to my mind, is that actually you then wouldn't get an integrated railway system. Um, and that's actually what people wanted. And I'll give you my direct experience of that. My, my direct experience of that was on, on the privatisation of, of British Airways. Um, you know, that gave us uh, freedom of what we did with routes and the first thing we did um, much to probably to Alistair's annoyance we cut all the Scottish routes because they were the most uneconomic routes um, yeah um, and that was a decision of, of private enterprise to run the most efficient um, system um, I don't think is that's what is intended for, for our railways because of actually the greater economic benefit that it brings Alistair. Yeah, um, I, I do remember that, Keith. Um, happily, it didn't last too long. Uh, what I would say, if, if I was the Secretary of State for Transport today and I was setting up British Railways, I would say you concentrating and making sure what you do now is done better. You know, it, it, there's a difference between, uh, you know, the air, an airline and the railways. You can try out a market 
uh, if you're flying an airline for two or three years and see if it works or not. And you can pick up where you think there's a need, there might not be a need and so on. Actually, moving a railway is something you don't do too often. Um, and indeed, if you look at uh, Dr. Beeching's work of uh, what 60, over 60 years ago, uh, it's only now people are beginning to realise we well, might have been over hasty closing some of these lines. For goodness sake, don't uh, that the planning legislation for England, which is what the question was asking about, you know, that will take you know a great deal of political effort on the part of now Michael Gove. I think the key thing, if you wanted my advice for this new British uh, Railways is to get the thing right, implement it, and then, you know, of course you must be sensitive as Maria says, but um, I think it's early days for you to start to offer to sort somebody else's problems out, which I may say look to me to be pretty intractable. Thanks, Alistair. Um, there's a question from John Cartledge about Transport Focus, which is the uh, the industry watchdog, um, uh, asking what people think about the, the reforms that should be made to that. Uh, it's addressed to you, Keith, but then anybody else who wants to come in afterwards as well. Yeah, I, when we were looking at the review, we, we questioned, if you like, the roles of, of, of each of the, um, of, of the transport bodies. I, I, to my mind, Transport Focus is an important element of that because it gives an external viewpoint into uh, the efficiency and the performance of, of the railway system. And I think having that third party external look in was, was an important um, retention. Maria, did you want to come in there? Well, yes, um, I couldn't agree more. And this is this is what's going to be, you know, talking about implementation and the challenges of implementation. It is going to need some good leadership to bring in all these different stakeholders and point of view together and um, and take the opportunity of GBR forward because it is a huge opportunity. Um, I would like to think that all of us, including you know Midlands Connect and the regions and the cities, will see it as an opportunity rather than keep trying to criticise what was there before. I think we all, all of us need a bit of a culture shift as well and trying to be constructive and positive. And uh, so people like Transport Focus, um, you know, transport authorities, we all going to have to help um, government and the department in taking this forward in a, in a different way. And we're all important and we all got massive, massive expertise to, to contribute to. But we've got to do it in a more positive, way, I will say. It's all of us. We need to be more positive about this. Thanks, Maria. Uh, there's a question from Roger Ford, which I think is probably addressed to Andy in the first instance, saying, how can the private sector thrive when the role of train operating companies will be greatly diminished with the introduction of passenger service contracts with no responsibility for timetables, fares or staffing stations? So a slightly pessimistic view. And uh, Andy, what would you say? So I, I think there's a lot to play for. I sort of touched on this uh, in my first contribution about the passenger service contracts, and we've got to get the detail of them right. So I think Roger's obviously absolutely right. The white paper clearly put, uh, points uh, to a sort of reduced role for operators in the sense of not being on uh, full revenue and, uh, and sort of cost risk in the way they are in the franchise model. Uh, and obviously it points to a whole range of aspects in terms of Great British Railways, setting timetables, setting fares, uh, and so on. But I think to get the right balance in those uh, in those contracts, and if you look at what the white paper is in other areas about the, the operator's role in uh, sort of meeting punctuality and uh, customer satisfaction targets, the operators are going to need meaningful input in a way that I think is perhaps more significant than, than is sort of explicitly set out uh, in the white paper. You're not going to be able to deliver for customers without uh, operators having a meaningful input into to timetable production. Obviously, the white paper uh, earmarks for operators that then the sort of delivery of that of that timetable, the actual train service. But similarly with fares, the white paper talks about Great British Railways sort of setting fares but actually operators are going to need to be able to respond to local markets. And particularly given the white paper says that in some of the passenger service contracts, um, I'm assuming the sort of later long distance contracts, operators will have more commercial freedom and revenue risk. Again, you would not be able to manage revenue risk without having a considerable degree of influence over, over the fare structure. So I actually think uh, one reading of the white paper would sort of would support what Roger's saying, a, a much diminished role for the, for the private sector. 
But I think as we work through the implementation of this, we've now got to get the detail right and actually argue the case of getting the balance right of what the private sector operators and other operators, for that matter, uh, input is uh, into Great British Railways, uh, setting what it is allocated to set uh, through those contracts. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Keith. It's interesting, isn't it, talking about timetabling, because um, I think the origin of the review is actually nobody took responsibility for time like timetabling in, in reality. Yeah, which is why we need the guiding mind, because um, ultimately the timetabling sat with the Secretary of State. And uh, yeah, I don't know, Alice, you felt about that, but uh, I, I never put the responsibility in the with the person who's probably the, the furthest away from it. So, you know, timetable time is, is the classic example to me of why you needed to create somebody who was in charge of it. Thanks, Keith. Um, question from Anonymous, which I think I'll ask Maria in the first instance. What should the top priorities of fares reform be in a post COVID system? Well, I will say this, wouldn't I? At the moment, is to get back people into. To loving the railways again. I think that's top priority. I think, uh, you know, we've seen um, people have gone back to the roads in a similar manner, even above what used to be pre-COVID. We're not at all anywhere near when it comes to railways. And that's all due to a number of reasons and it's not point going and dwelling on it too much, but we certainly need to get people uh, excited and confident uh, 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 um, to to go back onto onto the railways and to do that, you know, I quite agree with Keith. Fair fair reform is is going to be extremely important, and to do it in a manner that people can choose and travel as as they please, as they test themselves what hybrid working, for instance, means means for them. Um, so we we got to go into that space. Um, we're going to have to really also empower our operators to come up with innovative solutions too, in terms of how they reach out to customers, how information is shared. You know, we're we, we really going to have to be extremely adventurous uh, and creative. And that's something that perhaps, um, you know, we, we, we need a wider non-transport input in, into this, I, I will say. But that's the priority. And the other area I'm always mindful of is jobs and supply chain. You know, in the Midlands, for instance, we've got the biggest cluster of rail supply chain in the continent. Um, they look very much into, into what's being proposed here. Uh, and this has gone back to my pipeline rail enhancement element too. They do really need to know what's in the pipeline, what's been planned for enhancements, so they can invest in the skills, they can invest in um, the right sort of uh, uh, components and start you know, that journey of planning and preparing for delivery. Um, so, so there's two accounts, but at the moment I say priority number one is get people excited and back on the railways again. Thank you, Maria. I'm going to try and squeeze in one final question, which is amenable to a one word answer. It's from Anonymous and it, they ask which city in the UK is best to host the offices and staff of GBR? Uh, Andy, do you want to take that first? Oh, mean coming to me. I, I, I would <laughs> say where I think it, it, it probably uh, shouldn't be, given what we said about the cultural need to, to show a difference. It probably shouldn't be Milton Keynes. Um, it, uh, it probably shouldn't be London, given the uh, given the sort of political climate at the moment. But beyond that, I am certainly not going to pick favourites between uh, between the great cities of Great Britain. Uh, Maria? Don't get me into trouble. I'm a Midlander. So what will I say? You know, we've got great places in the Midlands. Um, you know, Derby, you know, we've got crew, you know, really home to, we, got, we are the heart of the network. So we're selling our places. Uh, believe you me, uh, we, we're working really hard to secure the location of GBR in the Midlands because we do feel we are the heart of the network and anybody could attend and, and visit us any, anywhere. Um, but never mind, I, I won't get into trouble. Uh, Alistair, you <laughs> might have a predictable answer too. Well, it's obviously Edinburgh, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah, quite. And I could keep, continue to have a close interest in what you get up to. Um, but wh wherever it is, it doesn't need to be in London. You know, it, there's an awful lot to be said for having it, uh, you, know, uh, out, you know, well away from London. If for no other reason, everybody working there would have to use their own ways to go to meet other people. So, um, um, uh, you know, I think we're probably all, all agreed on that. The important thing, though, you know, this is the last point I'm going to make. The guiding mind is a thing that caught my attention. And the sooner 
the government sets that up, that up. And I'm not sure you need legislation, actually, because of a shadow uh, board and, and so on. The sooner that gets going, the better. You know, the, the railway system in this country is generally very, very good. It's the most heavily used railway system, I think, uh, anywhere in the world. And you know, in my four years in transport, you know, I came to admire an awful lot of what the railways do. You know, I like the trains and I wish everybody the best. And thank you, Keith, for making the recommendations that you did. Thanks, Alistair. So, Keith, the, the guiding mind is important, but it shouldn't be in London. We have momentarily lost Keith, um, but we are at the end of our session anyway. Thank you all very much uh, for joining us. Unfortunately, we can't take all of the questions. We had a series of interesting questions to go from Manish on implementation, from Adam on ticketing and lots of others. Um, we squeezed in as many as we can. Um, the debate will continue, um, but for today, my thanks to all our speakers, Keith Williams, Alistair Darling, Maria Machinkosis, and Andy Bagnall. Thank you once again to the Rail Delivery Group for sponsoring the event and to everyone in the online audience for joining us. Goodbye.